Call the meeting to order. First item, second item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Do we have any revisions to the agenda? All right, hearing none, we'll deem it approved by consent. Number three, comments from the chair. So for those of you who weren't here last meeting, which was really just of this group, Aaron, John, who also is not here tonight, but he is a newborn. We'll give him a pass. So I, uh, I've submitted my resignation to the city council, and I'll be stepping down uh, effective tomorrow. I wanted to be here for this meeting, because who doesn't want to be part of this conversation? But um, I appreciate everyone's understanding that it's just I don't have enough time to give this the time it needs and deserves. So I... I'm sorry to be leaving because it's such a great group to work with and I will really miss you all. It's actually made it really hard to step down, but it's also a great time to step down when the group is so effective and working together so well. So um, because we'll, the time to elect a new chair will be January, that's what it is under the rules. Um, Kirby will resume. You'll have to. <laughs> it will fall to you as vice chair to run the meetings unless mm -hmm. anybody else um, expresses an interest and wants to bring that to the commission to consider to take over as chair. Do you have any further thoughts about taking it on officially? Uh, well, I, um, I'll have it put on the agenda next week and we'll have the discussion. But what you just said might, all, might make sense. I mean, I think that's a possibility is that we change nothing and I'll just run the meetings as vice chair until January, we could do that. Okay. But uh, if anyone does have an interest in being chair, I mean, I don't think it would hurt over the next two weeks to email the group about it to let us know. And if you're not sure... <laughs> <laughs> or if anyone's interested in being vice chair, that might be a reason to formally change things so that we can have a vice chair. And the key duties of vice chair have really just been running the meetings when the chair's not here, right? Yeah. And helping to determine what's on the agenda. That's one of the fun parts about being chair and vice chair. Are you comfortable being chair and our RPC person? That's another conversation that might be Excellent. worth having. So if anyone is interested in, uh, in what's going on at the RPC, uh, I would be relieved if someone <laughs> would like to take on being a representative there. We have a lot of people with young children on this commission. Right. That's, a, that's a Tuesday once a month. Uh, so. And then Barb's already volunteering for every other commission. Um, but, yeah. I mean, and, and the, the member of the, the city's appointee for the re regional planning commission doesn't have to be a member of the planning commission for Montpelier, but... It really makes sense if we can swing it, that it would be. So, all these things are things to consider. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we'll yeah, talk. please think about it. We'll have it. So now that John's back, I can say that we've decided you're going to be chair going yes. forward. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, all right. Um, and, and that's it for my comments. So the next item on the agenda, uh, item four, general business comes from the public about something not on the agenda so I assume everybody here is to talk about items that are on the agenda but if not please come forward and let's hear your thoughts okay hearing none we'll move on to item five which is our presentation and discussion of the proposed design review rules by the Historic Preservation Commission and with some input from our design review committee as well. So, come on up. Jamie, do you want to lead? I'll put the, I don't know if Jamie or Eric, whoever wants to go first. I'll put the PowerPoint in while you guys figure that out. So, we can't dim some of the lights. We either have them all on or mm -hmm. all off, so. Unless we open the back. Okay. That's true. Back. What is it's, your preference here? Let's see how it looks when it comes up. Okay. Just, uh, I mean, it's just a copy of that, but it's also for the public to be able yeah. to see. Sorry. Yeah. You want to go first? Yeah. I don't have too much. 
too much to say. I think the first thing is to... So, but well, first thing is probably to introduce yourself, because I'm oh. not sure that everybody here knows you. I'm Eric Gilbertson. I am uh, chair of the Historic Preservation Commission and sit on the Design Review Committee. And, uh, and you have a long list of credentials with historic preservation. 45 years of historic preservation stuff, including for the state. Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for 30 years. Eric, can I ask you to speak up? I'll, I'll do this whatever you're getting quiet again. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, first thing I want to do is thank uh, Meredith and Sarah McShane for all the help they've been in drafting these and getting through and integrating them. We couldn't have done it without that help. And thank members of the Preservation Commission and design review because this has been a bit of a slog. We've been at it since 2017. I can't remember exactly when we started. Uh, when the, actually the Planning Commission, I think, charged us, or the City Council charged us with developing regulations with the idea that then these would be regulations for the design review committee. Uh, and in the process, this has to be approved by the Planning Commission who then recommends it to the city council. And maybe next year we'll have that. I'm not optimistic on time frames. Uh, we, had, we had some goals. First, you probably all heard about the, there was a lot of complaining about design review. Uh, and I think a lot of that was unjustified, but nonetheless, the City Council heard it, and the Planning Commission heard it, and so they wanted a redraft uh, of the regulations. The other thing I think that's pertinent is that uh, through a certified local government grant from the state, uh, uh, we got some money to revise the regulations, and, re and we uh, uh, updated the National Register nomination which is not a huge change. I, I don't want to really talk about that now. But, uh, and I think we had some goals in terms of clarity and ease of, ease of applying and making it make sense to people. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to do was kind of provide some opportunities for Oh, benefits. And, uh, we've talked to Mike about uh, the idea of uh, <coughs> adding uh, maybe some uh, tax abatement for people who do work that meets the standards uh, on historic buildings so that they have some reason to do it the right way. Uh, and either in the design review district or anywhere, haven't decided that. Uh, and we did base a lot of this on federal regulations, the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, uh, because they are a nationally accepted set of standards uh, that are used by a lot of design review people. Uh, they're used by the state to review projects, and there's a lot of supportive material. And we looked at some others, uh, other municipalities design review uh, and we went through it we held it I guess you see all this I shouldn't talk about it, but we tried to be as open to the public as we could uh, to get public input particularly based on the complaints that were lodged uh, did you have much engagement no I mean we e notified people we emailed them we called them and, uh, uh, so, no, we didn't have a lot, <laughs> but we provided the opportunity. So uh, uh, that's it, and, and one of the things that, he, uh, that I noticed, I was kind of looking at stuff today, and uh, the first couple of paragraphs are really a strong statement about how important historic preservation is to the city of Montpelier. Uh, we would not be the community we are without the historic buildings. 
and design review is really the idea is to protect the historic building and protect our historic neighborhoods uh, from people doing really outlandish things. It isn't to stop people from change, it's that it, people can make a change as long as it's compatible. So. But what is outlandish is something that sort of <laughs> oh, <laughs> people don't always I, agree, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, and you know, what happens is it devalues the other buildings in the neighborhood. If somebody uh, builds a five story tower, or whatever, on uh, their house, or, uh, you know, and one of, one of my things uh, over the years, and there's a piece in here about this, is uh, the kind of incremental change that takes place in buildings, you know, okay, that's not much, that's just a window trim, that doesn't really affect the building. But then you lose the door trim, and then you lose a dormer, and then you lose the windows, and then you lose all of, the, all of a sudden you don't have a building that really conveys its historic significance at all. And those things kind of creep up on you. Uh, there's a poster that I like that was done by the uh, students at the University of Vermont called Vulnerable Vermont that just shows buildings in various stages of, of change. It goes from a very nice but simple historic building to one that nobody would care about. And I, I think the neighborhoods are very important uh, along with the downtown. I think there's pretty universal consensus about the historic importance of the downtown and the contribution that it makes to living in Montpelier. Uh, a little less enthusiasm maybe for some of the neighborhoods, but they're important as well. Any questions? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry to see you're leaving, but I understand. Thank you. I need to follow your example. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so next. Hi, my name is Jamie Duggan. I'm the uh, vice chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. And uh, I also spent a uh, tour of duty on the design review committee for many years, about 10 years ago. So had some experience um, implementing some of these regulations. So I thought I would go through the PowerPoint we've uh, put together for you folks real quick and uh, see if there were any questions that came out of that. That's okay. It's right here. So, uh, as Eric said, we had started this process uh, more f formally back in September of 2017 uh, in response to some of the concerns that had happened. And we uh, looked to a lot of different uh, sources and resources to help us sort of uh, set the, um, the context of what we were going to be working with. Uh, we looked at different towns across Vermont, some nationwide examples, uh, some different unique situations that uh, we could learn from. Uh, again, uh, best practices from the National Park Service and American Planning Association. We worked with a professional on uh, the CLG grant, Landworks helped us uh, to um, kind of guide us and set up a framework to work within. And then uh, a number of us have experience uh, in historic preservation in different aspects, both in our um, work and in our private lives. So uh, there was a real rich um, input that happened uh, to this process. So we started back. Uh, yep. Question real quick. Yep. Uh, so the example rigs from Vermont towns. Yes. Uh, how many of them follow the Secretary of Interior standards, like just so we can have a sort of a baseline understanding of that? Uh, a good deal of them do. Yeah. And it seems from review that the ones that do use that have greater success, it seems, and um, uh, or less um, appeals, less, uh, there's more clarity to what the expectations are. And so that's something that we, in this process, using those as the guide, we also made sure to include definitions for the terms that are found within there and our interpretation uh, as a group and how those should be used. Uh, but following those standards, and um, there were, Elizabeth, I know, had looked at a bunch. A lot of them followed the standards. Well, and we, there, it's not going to pick up unless you're right next to that microphone, or if you go over really the big microphone. If, if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. All right. No, it's okay. Yeah. 
Um, the state recently did a, uh, two years ago, had a, a temporary staff person that looked at design review within the state, um, and the majority of them do follow the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, and the ones that don't um, have not been updated recently, <laughs> Um, any recent updates follow the standards that, that we're aware of. But we also looked at design review standards, um, a, a scattering from across the country. Uh, the National Association for Preservation Commissions that has a great website that provided links to um, a lot of recent design review district updates. Um, and so we were kind of referencing that and kind of pulling from different elements um, that we thought would be helpful. Okay. Sorry. Sorry if I messed up the flow there. No, not at all. Okay. Um, any questions as we go along? I think it's important to address while we're here. So, um, so uh, April 4th, we had a kickoff um, meeting. We sent out a notice to all the property owners within the district, let them know what was going on. We started some outreach at the farmer's market. Um, had a table out there engaging with the public and getting some feedback. There were some walking tours and uh, just trying to um, hear people's thoughts and, and see what's happening. There were, um, we had two more public meetings um, through that summer of 2018. Uh, we did get uh, some folks to come down and, and share with us the positive feedback, negative feedback, uh, and a little bit of uh, both in some cases. And um, David Raphael uh, did a presentation on uh, the 4th as well uh, in April. And then we had an open house to get folks to come in and solicit the feedback. And that's when we also had some uh, participation. Uh, I talked to some folks up on um, Northfield Street that day, as I recall, and um, people just wanting to understand the process better. Uh, we reached out to other um, committees and authorities throughout uh, the city to look for their input. We've worked closely with the Design Review Committee, uh, reached out to the Design Development Review Board, the Tree Board, the Conservation Commission, um, and we attended the DRC's public meeting uh, the beginning of this year to have a discussion about that as well. And then uh, our uh, Planning Director, Mike Miller, and Meredith, Zoning Administrator, uh, were real helpful in looking at this from the city's lens and the enforceability and how to work this process. One thing through this, one of our primary goals through this was to allow easier pathways for people to get approval for basic, straightforward work that they're doing so that they didn't necessarily have to come to a DRC meeting, come to the DRB meeting. There are a lot more things that are being able to be handled administratively. And uh, that gives, uh, that I think is a huge benefit. Um, again, we, we wanted people to be able to uh, have more predictability with the process and have a consistent process uh, throughout. Uh, it's important to be able to defend these decisions. Um, we have seen appeals uh, recently and continuing. So uh, that's an important aspect. Um, and we also wanted to look at this as a design review district, uh, looking at the downtown development uh, area and not just the historic district. Those boundaries are not mutually contiguous. So um, that's something that perhaps moving forward um, might, might see some adjustment. Uh, as Eric said, we're a CLG, which is a, a program of the National Park Service. And as, uh, as a part of that, it is a requirement that these rehabilitation standards are included in this process in order for us, the Historic Preservation Commission, to keep our CLG status. Uh, so that is a really important, I think, point to make. And um, that is also a, a standard that happens, again, throughout communities all across um, the nation. So. Uh, we tried to give some more flexibility and uh, more opportunity for exemptions, things that were clearly uh, replacement and define those so that it's, uh, there's clarity within that. Um, sometimes flexibility without a, a certain amount of clarity can, can get great, fuzzy, so we tried to sharpen that a little bit. Um, and also to see how these work with the overlay uh, district boundaries um, and what future they may have. So uh, we did add uh, a few specific standards for alterations uh, and additions to buildings. 
that you can find in these references. And I don't know if you want to go and look at those now as we do that, or if you want to continue with a sort of more broad view, but I'm happy to do either. So um, quick point of clarification, what is the title number for those section, statute section numbers? These are, these are the zoning regulation Oh, that's in the zone, okay. This is, these are the, the changes in the draft regulations that are in your packet. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so we added some standards. We clarified the application process uh, and again added more opportunity for administrative approval and increased uh, exemptions and clarified what the uh, limitations of those would be. Into the yeah, this is right down into the weeds. But, um, <laughs> if you go back to the last slide, can you talk this. us through some of the specific comments that led you to create these goals? Sure. Um, I think that uh, there was a lot of subjectivity in the previous, um, the way the previous regs were written as far as uh, replacement, when it's appropriate, what replacement in kind is, or how do you um, deal with a situation where there's deteriorated materials, what's the correct way to approach that? And um, there's many different ways that that can be achieved. And so I think uh, some of the feedback that we got was that um, understanding what the goal is in in replacement is a, an important thing or repair uh, so we explained in the regs I think a little more clearly what repair in kind means um, which is the first sort of approach following the Secretary of the Interior standards uh, retain as much historic fabric as possible and then when you can't replace in kind and when you can't replace something in kind for whatever reason then there's some alternatives that you can look at but um, the process really requires going through that sort of um, iterative pathway in a way uh, um, looking at it a lot of times for example when we look at windows um, there is a value in the uh, restoration of windows that needs to be understood in order to uh, determine whether putting replacement windows in is the appropriate decision in a certain situation. There are many factors to look at, the conditions of the window and uh, um, you know, what type of fabric it is, how they work, if there's storms, energy efficiency. Um, all of those add in, but uh, there's at times when certain um, factors will trigger a particular uh, pathway, and that can get very convoluted without, I think, some clear direction and understanding what the steps are. So we tried to lay out the process even, the application process, moving to the next part, part so that it can be very clear in capturing the information that will help guide those decisions. Uh, because folks got, I think, are frustrated when they came, come and present, uh, they present something not really knowing what the goal is or what uh, the design review committee might be looking for to check off the box that says that it meets the standards. So by giving a little more direction into uh, what are the factors that need to be considered to get to the next decision, uh, that's, I think, a lot of what we had focused on. Um, and then there are plenty of things that we pulled out that just can be easily reviewed. Uh, and I, that I think we got a lot of feedback from folks that, you know, I'm just, I'm just repainting my house or I'm just doing something that doesn't have uh, an effect necessarily or an a adverse effect, uh, the potential to affect some of the things that uh, the standards look to in, in, in basing their understanding on this stuff. Is that? Very helpful. Help a little bit. So, well, so just yeah, just understand uh, better about what we're looking at. So the current regs are relatively short. Yes. Three and a half pages. The new one is quite a lot longer, more than double the size. Okay. But from what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that this isn't all new material. A lot of this is currently how design review happens, 
it's just kind of spelled out in a detailed way now. Is that that a was good a way to primary think about goal? It? Yes. Okay. And you know, I, if anyone in the design review committee or other members of the HP Commission want to respond to that as well, because mm -hmm. there was a lot of input and 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 a lot of understanding of sort of what the process has been. The one other thing, I don't think it's in this presentation, is that our next project is really to provide some guidelines for people that are, you know, they're not regulations, they're guidelines to help people comply with the regulations. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very important to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the other piece of it is that uh, it uh, uh, sort of formalizes uh, a preliminary review by design review. If somebody wants to come in, they do it anyway now, quite frequently, and usually say, here's my project, here's what I'm planning to do, and we have an informal comment period on it. And that's included in the regulations now. And that should be very helpful to people doing the project. Just have a question. Will, the guide, will those guidelines be illustrated? Hopefully. Yeah. That yeah. Would be that's the rule. Yeah. yeah, pictures and uh, uh, Shelburne's done some fairly complete guidelines. We, well, one of our uh, goals would, once we close out this process and we're able to apply for another CLG grant from the state, we would do that. And I, we've informally, we think that that would be the next uh, good project to move forward to help as a companion to this. And, and um, are you looking for some feedback from us on this draft before you move forward with the guideline process? Is that yeah. Yes, um, so, Meredith Crandall, Zoning Administrator and also staff for HPC and um, DRC. My suggestion would be that not just getting Planning Commission feedback, but that the guidelines and the investment of both time and money to draft those should probably wait until after the new design review regulations are close to adopted or adopted because it has to go through you as well as city council and so there's a good chance that you know there's a chance that swaths of this may change so investing the time and money into drafting illustrations before we know what the final product is going to be doesn't make a whole lot of sense mm -hmm. um and just to address kirby's point about the pretty large change in in length here um as a zoning administrator Having something that is really clear-cut and defensible um, is something that the design review regulations really needed. Um, a lot of things in the current design review regulations, there's no definitions for how you deal with them. Um, there's guidance, but that's not necessarily something that you can point to once you hit an appeal. Um, and it's it looks like it's a huge change as Jamie was saying a lot of this is just spelling out how things have been done along the way and making it really clear for somebody who just wants to look at the regs and figure it out um, and also just like I said having it defensible being like this is why having the DRC be able to point to this is why we made our recommendation and the development review board or myself <coughs> be able to point to something else when we make a decision that says this is why we made the decision we made so, Meredith, in your experience, is the, the proposed version of things here and the definitions that are part of it, are they consistent with the interpretations that have been made of the old regs in the past? Um, to the parts that are meant to be that way, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, there, there are substantive yeah. changes in here. Mm -hmm. And I've only been in this position for a little over a year. But I feel like the majority of what's in here is very consistent with what has happened previously, except where it is intentionally different. Um, you know, there are, there are very clear cut differences in here now between um, brand new construction in the design review district versus alterations to or additions to current buildings and especially historic buildings. Um, that's something that is a a clear difference compared to the current regulations, but isn't necessarily different from how they were, have been interpreted along the way. Um, but it makes it clearer for everybody. Does that help? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yep. and, and back, just back to process, I, I appreciate your recommendation that we don't want to spend our time focusing on something that's going to 
be obsolete yeah. pretty quickly. Um, I'm curious for input from, maybe you'll get to this in your presentation and I'm jumping the gun, but how to, how the, the regs and the guide, guidelines will interact and, I mean, it's sort of like a chicken and egg thing where the guidelines kind of help flesh out the specifics of the regs and so I'm worried we'll miss something in the regs if we're waiting on the guidelines, but your facial expression tells me that's probably <laughs> not the case. Um, I mean, this might go to the current DRC members, but during our DRC meetings, it's not like the current guidelines that we used are referenced almost ever, correct? I mean, the guidelines are more for the, in some ways, at this point, the applicant's use. And I'm not sure that that many of those will change too much. We'll still be able to use some of the current yeah, the guidelines. Current, the current uh, you know, I just to give some history, I've been on the design review probably pretty close to 20 years now. And I, I don't think that these are drastically change the decisions that are going to come out. Steve, you've been on for a long time. You know, they're just... Uh, and uh, the other thing I, I wanted to uh, say is that uh, you know par part of this process is defining the boundaries of the new district, and we felt we wanted to join with the planning commission to do that. I think that's going to be the most politically sensitive part, and I think it's appropriate for the planning commission to be setting boundaries of, of districts within the city anyway, but. Uh, so, and uh, the guidelines now, this is what I got up originally to say, is are based on a 1977 Montpelier, what's the name Montpelier? Cityscape. Cityscape that was done uh, when I worked at the, early when I worked at the division. So, you know, it's, it's dated, you know, as are the current regulations. They've been changed a couple of times. Please, Eric, it's historic. <laughs> well, d damn near. <laughs> Not yet. Um, oh, okay. But, but we can change it. <laughs> can't change it. So, yeah, I mean, that's sort of it jumped a little bit to the end here in that, again, I don't if you want to go through some of the specific standards and, and how we, uh, how they were drafted and we changed them. But I think we're, we're feeling a sense of uh, that we're nearing completion on this. And of course, we're looking for, um, you know, uh, your consideration of these and how, uh, how to move this forward in that process. Um, and then, you know, we can talk about what, what comes after this, but, um, whoops. Um, do you wanna continue through some of the changes? Yeah, I think, yep. I think that'll be the most productive use of time okay. is to walk through the changes and discuss the um, the prompt for the change and the concerns that yep. may have been raised and how you dealt with it and any implementing concerns that you have. I mean, basically, let's just go through it one by one. Okay. And it might be a little tedious, but I think it'll be the most productive way. So to I think we had talked about that. So... Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the design review standards is uh, the general design standards. We looked at uh, both of these. Um, so an explanation of what the design review standards are um, and the review of applications, how those standards are implemented. And then went through and looked at uh, general design standards, which are essentially the Secretary of the Interior standards uh, for rehabilitation with a few additional uh, specific um, they, they're, actually no, that's not correct. I think Elizabeth has some. Yeah, Elizabeth, you should. I think Liz is gonna step in. Good. 
You can also um, pull up a chair. Do you want to sit here? Yeah. Sit. No, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that it would be helpful just to kind of set up that the current design review standards are established under the state regulation um, for a design review overlay district. Um, I think one of the questions had been whether to be a design review district or a historic review district. Um, and with, you know, the all of the state activity and commercial activity in Montpelier, um, there is a lot of development opportunities in the in the downtown and um, you know, we decided to stick with design review overlay district, which is why we broke out a lot of the standards between alterations to existing versus new construction. Um, and then under alterations to existing, talking specifically about what would apply towards a historic structure or a non-contributing existing structure. Um, so that a 1980s building is not held to the same standard as an 1870s building um, and really spell that out in the regulation um, so that people can understand that that just because they're in the downtown doesn't mean they have to keep everything we're not looking for a snapshot in time we're looking for a controlled um, and measured growth and change in our community I think that was the intro you were looking for, Jamie, maybe? That is, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't think you should go too far. <laughs> Jamie, are you trying to just figure out, this was me just breaking out how the, our general standards are different from our specific right. subset standards. So do you want to go through, I guess that's what I'm, I'm, I was giving more of an overview, but do you want to go into, look at these standards and, uh, or are we still? Yeah, um, yeah, I think so, but maybe we should, we've been hearing from Historic Preservation Commission members, right? Yes. But mainly, and I mean, it gets confusing because Eric overlaps, you overlap, I just want to make sure. We've been hearing from the Historic Preservation Commission's development of this. Has the Design Review Committee been involved or have any overarching thoughts to share before we go into the specific language? <laughs> and will you mind introducing yourself for the group? No, I'd be glad to. <laughs> I'm Steve Everett. Uh, I've lived in Montpelier for 48 years, and I've been on the design review committee for, I think, 100 years. <laughs> and your chair. <laughs> and I'm the chair. Yeah. And I look at the Design Review Committee as a technical resource for people who want to do something with their building, whether it's a rehab, a remodel, or a paint job, or whether they're building something new. And we're very lucky on the committee that we have a number of architects, builders, people like Eric with a tremendous amount of experience, and people who've had experience restoring buildings, trying to recreate. Um, the look that it had a hundred years ago. We're also looking at changes that make buildings more efficient in terms of efficiency, changes in heating systems, solar options, using current technology to make the building efficient, more workable, and at the same time preserve the historic value of the building which is Montpelier's greatest resource. If you think about what we have in town, um, that is, I think, for downtown in particular, that is our greatest draw for people who want to live here, visit here, work here. And we hear that, I have an office in town, and I hear that constantly, that people come here for the first time and they go, wow, and they keep coming back because they appreciate that value. And again, I look at our committee as trying to do a lot of those things with each application. Uh, we take the application, try to 
maybe give the person some feedback, some alternatives. We frequently in an application will give them some options. Uh, we've had a number of people come back to us and thank us for those options. In one particular case, the person saved about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on their project based on options that some of the architects and what I consider valuable resource people on the committee offered. As far as the regulations go, we work with the general criteria and standards for each project. And obviously there are certain projects that have more stringent requirements based on whether they're looking for tax credits, under which programs. So there's a lot to deal with. And again, because of the variety of expertise on the committee, I think that we can try to offer some of those, some of that information to the applicants. And again, I see our committee as a resource for the applicants. Do you have any specific questions? Um, well, we got a lot of feedback from members of the public when we were first cracking open the draft bylaws, uh, and Eric spoke for both commissions pretty frequently. Um, I'm wondering if there's, you know, what what does the design review committee have to say in response to some of the issues that were presented and what are your thoughts on how I think a lot of the negative changes? feedback that came out some of some of those meetings had to do with some personalities from years ago mm -hmm. and personalities like, on the committee or personalities applying for all permits. of the above okay and a lot of times people would come in with a project half done that they didn't even know they were either in the design review committee or didn't realize they had to come before to get approval for something or were doing something that some salesman sold them on and there there are issues with what they were being done both technically and as far as meeting the criteria and when you're halfway into a project that's going to cost you ten or twenty thousand dollars, they probably didn't want to hear anything <laughs> otherwise. So that's just part of the application process, and that's part of the education process for people who buy properties in Montpelier. They should realize that they are in a review district, and again, we should offer our services as technical. Uh, as a technical resource, as well as a, you know, trying to make sure the projects meet the criteria for, for approval. Any other general questions for Steve while we have him up there? I'm sure we'll have more. Well, I mean, oh. just a general concern I have is just the additional expense and time it would take for especially homeowners in the design review district to. Uh, comply with regulations. So, can you respond to that? I mean, it just seems like owning a home in the design review district, it, it might be limiting people to a certain, you know, economic sort of and, you know, able to deal with these kind of regulations um, to have that kind of level. So, if you could respond to that, that would be to helpful. be more sophisticated and yes, have more money. That's what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a concern I have, but I'd be interested to hear your response. Sometimes that is the case. I mean, you know, everybody tries to do, make an improvement with it at the lowest possible cost. But at the same time, if you look at it over the long haul, it's worthwhile to do a quality project that has lasting value, uh, lasting efficiency, lasting value, whether you tend to live there and have it last a long time, whether you live there for the next 10 years and you've done a, something, an improvement that's going to last 50 to 100 years in terms of either value to you while you live there or value 10 years down the road if you decide to sell the place. So again, that's one of the things that I think the committee can act as a resource because of the, the architects and people with building experience uh, can offer people alternatives that it can still be cost effective. And not everybody can do a major rehab all at once. You know, some people can spend five or $10,000 on some projects 
and maybe other people come in with a total rehab that's a $200,000 rehab of a building. And again, we try to look at each person that's there, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve, and what their budget is. You, you mentioned in the past there being a problem with uh, folks not knowing that they needed to go through the design review until they were into the project. Is that something that should be on our radar as something that we need to address as well? Like, is that something that's ongoing? I think that's something that any, any realtor in town who's selling a property ought to make the, the buyer aware of the fact that they're, what they're buying, number one, it, they may appreciate that it has value because it may be on the historic register or it's in a historic district, but at the same time, let them know that, you know, if they want to do improvements, that because it's in a design district, that they need to present an application to a committee. What I'm thinking of is, uh, so you've been a homeowner for a while, but you haven't really <clears throat> You never thought about doing a big project, and then all of a sudden you do get that idea. Maybe you finally are in a like, financial position where you can. Do you think that the residents of Montpelier in the design review district are educated enough generally to know that they need to go through an administrative approval, or is that or is there some outreach? Well, that I, think, I think we need to I think, think some maybe Meredith's office alerts them sometimes. But they sure. have to go to Meredith first, is kind of part of what I'm getting at. Okay to get a building permit. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of just the broad spectrum. If they come to the planning department with any project that they have to do and touch base with us, we let them know if they need, if they're in the design review district, if they need a building permit, if they right. need a zoning permit. There are people who don't get in touch with us at all, so right. we don't know about the project. And that's, and that's just at. a, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that is a administrative outreach item, and I know that you know the Historic Preservation Commission is thinking about outreach to say realtors or other other entities along that way to help with the education. Um, it's something that you know the planning department can definitely put on its radar, but that would also be basically a mailing to every single property owner and and you know address in the city as to what districts they're in. Um, so it would be something we could add in. But it's also just an administrative sort of bandwidth question as well, um, and one of the many or things. Or something in the bridge, or something. I mean, yeah, or other ways. No, that's to, there's there's other ways to do it, yeah. um, and I can definitely talk to to Mike and Andre and everybody about that down in the planning department um, to see what what we could do about that. Um, really quick too. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, 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 no. But, Go. Uh, also, just through the process prior to this of updating the National Register District, there were a number of required mailings to every owner in the district. So mm -hmm. those folks have been notified within the last couple of years of their presence within a, you know, uh, a situation that might need a little more understanding yeah. than it, perhaps they knew what they're getting into. But at the same point in time, that's, I think, what um, we, um, there's a lot of things in uh, the exempt development that had not, that is much more clear than was previous. So um, it lets people know when they don't need to. Uh, there are some very clear things that don't require. And I think that's uh, a, a really good improvement or understanding um, when they trigger that process. I think the number of people that come in. I usually have to do that, Meredith, so I, I, I really appreciate having someone else. I think the number me. of people coming in with projects that they've started or completed is less than it used to be. I mean, one in, in the 20 years I've been around, one case went to court. Uh, and, you know, that's it. I don't think that's too bad. Uh, Generally, and I think as we go through the complete this process uh, and have public meetings, more people will understand it. And, I mean, it's any anybody doing a title shirt, search should tell a owner when they buy a property. But I understand if somebody's owned a place for 20 years, they might not have thought about it. They may have been told. But I think I think for a lot of people, it's one of those things where you don't it's you don't care at all until yeah. all of a sudden you've made a decision where all of a sudden you need to care. 
and just also, and also thinks that there's some synergy with us going through the process that we're going through now and maybe doing some outreach yeah, while we're doing it. It's, I mean, it, and it's going to happen no matter what you do. And then you just want to reduce yeah. it. The other thing you asked about costs, and I, I don't think we've had much of an issue with costs. I mean, most of the things that we talk about don't require people to spend a lot of money or the uh, it in, increases the value of their property I mean it's uh, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation has done a study and property values increase in an historic district that is under design review do you factor in maintenance costs at all like if you don't replace your windows the maintenance cost of keeping older windows uh, no, I, th I mean, there have been studies done that, that you know, that the, the, the new windows don't last very well, 20 years, and historic windows 100 years, so. I, I, I don't honestly think the cost is a big factor. The other thing is the standards are pretty flexible because the standards, these are for rehabilitation projects, and you'll notice there's, if possible, in there. So that you know, that we, there's some flexibility to deal with the solution, and in all the cases that I can remember where people have started, we come up with some kind of a solution. They might not like it uh, necessarily. Uh, one case, a downtown building bought all the windows before they came to design review, and the compromise: well, you can put them in at the back of the building, but you have to do the right ones at the front. So it's you know it's. Like any negotiation, I guess. So, so the reason we're asking a lot of questions about this is because these are the, some of the things that we've heard and we're concerned about. I mean, really, I mean, I don't think that anybody on the Planning Commission feels like historic preservation is, is not important. We all agree it's important. It's just we all want to figure out how it mixes and potentially, how does it overlap? How does it potentially impede other goals or are those false conflicts? You know, all of those things. and. What, what is the impact on the average homeowner who doesn't have a lot of money? I mean, is this going to hinder growth or op affordable housing? And so the, that's where all these questions are coming from. And it's A, to understand it better just so we can process it and understand how the goals are from a more holistic kind of goals of the city in planning are met, and also B, so that when we receive public comment, we can explain some of these these uh, concerns. So that's where all these questions are coming from. It's not meant to criticize. Can I just address the whole public outreach, public knowledge issue? It's, it's a situation, you know, if people come to the planning department and say, hey, I've got this project I'm doing, I, I've already lined up everybody, this is what I'm doing, or hey, I've already done this but suddenly my contractor says I need a permit. That happens with everything. It's not just design review. Oh, right. It's, so yep. I don't see that happening any more with design review mm -hmm. than I do with any other thing, even just a driveway. Mm -hmm. um, it's one, one to explain, kind of, kind of following what Leslie's lead and explaining some of the background behind the question is, uh, you know, like as Leslie was just suggesting, we, we're trying to think of every stakeholder involved, mm -hmm. you know, in the city. And, and there's people who may be uh, uh, skeptical or whatever you want to say about design review. And uh, so if we, if we can think of ways to help prevent conflicts mm -hmm. while doing this, then that's just, you know. Yep. Well, and that's, that's also one reason, as I said, we tried to clarify in here a bunch of exemptions so that yeah. when you do get to the re potentially redrawing the design review overlay district mm -hmm. or potentially districts, however you want to do it, um, people who are looking at, oh, I'm going to be in the district or I am in the district, how does this apply to me? There's some more clarity in what it actually means. And, and that's also part of why I'm thinking of outreach and how it could be maybe important in this process because if we're having, if we're having new exemptions and things, Getting the word out about that seems mm -hmm. important. Um, yep. Nope. There's there's been lots of public notice through the drafting process, and I think it's when you're ready to take this on. I think coordination with the planning department and figuring out additional outreach options um, 
would be good. I don't know is, you know, I think we want to coordinate that all. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense for you. Yeah. Okay. One of the challenges we see is that people don't necessarily engage until something's about to be adopted because they're okay. like, well, why would I bother if it's not going <laughs> anywhere? So it's, it's just an issue always. I would just like to, to chime in that um, Eric said that we didn't have a, a huge amount of public participation in the drafting, but I would say that we did have um, some really uh, quality participation. Um, you know, the, the open house that we did, we did not have a huge crowd, but the, the folks that came out for that open house we're able to look at a draft of the exemption list and the administrative review list. Um, and so we were able to get some really good feedback on that. Um, some people came because they were really unsure about what, what design review would be. Um, and I think through conversation, a lot of their, their questions were answered by saying, oh, I won't have to come to get my house painted, but I do now. Um, and so I, I don't think that was necessarily something that they were expecting mm -hmm. when they first got like the postcard saying, hey, we're talking about this. They were expecting the standards to get a lot stricter. Um, and so I think that there was a fair amount of relief that um, there were avenues for single family homeowners and for business owners to do the, the reasonable and standard maintenance that we all want you know, local property owners to be doing. So, and we also got feedback of people outside of the district that wish they were in the district um, because they are aware that their neighbors at the moment could do almost anything, mm -hmm. um, specifically up like on the College Hill, College Street area, so. Yeah, that you raise a, you triggered a, a thought about one of the important pieces when you're revising regulations is having a comparison of what the current regs allow or prevent and what mm -hmm. the new regs will allow or prevent and what changes are being made is really going to help city council i think in looking at these and make that a more productive conversation yeah. you've been that's well yeah it, <laughs> that's just kind of hard to clarify since there are no there's a very short list of exemptions for the current mm -hmm. i mean you can do a comparison it's it's going to be difficult to really do a true side by side of those. Yeah. Um, we tried to sort say, of do something like that in here and it wasn't it, it was not really presentable. Okay, okay. <laughs> because when we are going through the the big zoning rewrite yeah. that Mike kept getting asked over and over again for this and he kept saying, I can't I mean it's a well, completely new product. Right. I can't And that's I mean so. we can you can we'll be able to do a here's the exemptions list, here's the exemptions list. It's mm -hmm. not gonna be a red line. Um, because it's just new language right. um, and there you know there was no avenue for administrative design review approval previously if you're in the design review district you're either exempt or you have to go to the design review committee and the new draft there's also a whole subset of things where yeah you're in design review you're not exempt but all you need is administrative approval you have to meet these select criteria and you've got it um, so I mean, there's there's key differences, mm -hmm. but it's it's going to be very hard to do a a red line of any sort. Yeah, I don't think a strict red line would be. I, and then I'm just. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I'm it's not definitely saying something can be worked on. Go back and do this. It, it just, also just takes. Oh When yeah. it comes to what you guys decide you want to do and going to city council, I'm sure we can support and find okay. a way to to create something like that as a more elaborate. Yeah presentation or posters, things like that. Um, we just have to find the bandwidth. Okay. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> yeah. A uh, couple of things. That's, what you're saying is one, the reasons we put in the first three paragraphs. Okay. Explaining that this is an interest of the city. It's a public, it's a public interest to have design review. I mean, design review is yeah, done pretty well in the city oh, these three. Okay. for the last 40 years. Uh, in terms of preserving its historic character. I'm not sure the decisions will change a lot. What do you think, Steve? I don't think so. I mean, it's, it it's, it's, a, it's, a, an, you know, the biggest challenge is the, you know, designs of new buildings that may be going up in town and who knows when. 
Steve, we can't hear yeah, you. The know. public no, can't hear you. The, just the, the, the biggest the biggest challenge is going to be new buildings, which is one reason these regulations, the new draft regulations, have a whole section on new construction. Mm -hmm. I think if, if the, the other piece would proceed as new regulation. I mean, we should definitely. No, it's a clarification. The the current the current the current design review regulations cover new construction. It just it's not because they're very fuzzy. It's it's so subjective, right? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. that ha it, it it might not be interpreted consistently when board members change, versus having clear cut. This is what applies to new development. This is what applies to you know existing and and modifications to that. And you know it's it's not the current the current regulations regulate new development. He, this is just going to be clearer and to say, be, be specific about things that we, the design review committee right. really doesn't care about for new development. So, can I chime in? Can I chime in? Sure. Okay, so so in the, in the current regulations, um, the two that are really most applicable to new construction at the moment um, is harmony of exterior design with other properties in the district Mm -hmm. That's that full statement. And that's the full district. <laughs> the full district. Um, and then prevention of the use of incompatible designs, buildings, color schemes, or exterior materials. Um, so it's regulated in such a broad, open way that it really leaves the, the city very vulnerable to appeals of any decision by the design review and DRB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Classic example is of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Come up here. That's a classic <laughs> example of a new, new construction or a new addition is the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Years ago, they put that addition on the back. That addition on the back is compatible with the original design, but it's not identical to the original design. So again, there has to be enough leeway to allow a design, a creative design, and a lot of the architects feel like they want to make, whether it's a new building or an addition to an existing building, they want it to be a statement of the time now mm -hmm. rather than 140 years ago when the library might have been originally built. So again, there has to be enough flexibility in that to accommodate some of those the newer projects, but at the same time, sort of form a template for approving something like that. I mean, I think that works very well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, there was a lot of mixed emotion about that. But I, th I think overall, I think people thought it was OK in its design stage. And I think that people find that it's very tasteful in, a, in, a, in its completed state. So I'm, John has something to say, but after that, I, want, I haven't heard anything from Barb, which is very surprising. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I read through them. I have a couple of really small questions. Okay. So I'll, I'll hold that. Okay. Before I sit down permanently. <laughs> uh, That's definitely not going to happen. Um, <laughs> I believe it was. Well, I've been in a regulatory environment, the state level, the federal level, the local level, uh, in two different states. And People do not like regulations. There's a segment of the population that is just not going to like regulations. They're going to find reasons not to have it. They're going to find reasons it's intrusive on their private property rights. They're going to go into all of this stuff. But that's one reason why the statement that it really is in the interest of the city to preserve its historic buildings. So that's what you kind of go back to with all of it, that this is a, a public interest matter. Uh, and the cost differential, I, I realize that's significant, but it has. I mean, we all agree we want clean air, and the cost to businesses for that is expensive. This is this is going to be an incremental piece, uh, so depending on what people want to do. But. Yeah. So I had a question about um, the. I think the. the Committee is like a great asset to Montpelier, and um, more people should should use it. And it's an underused resource. I'm wondering, is there um, or is there an opportunity to capture some of the advice or the decisions beyond 
I'm sure we have meetings and approved or denied building permits, but people don't really like to read those. Um, I imagine you give a lot of similar advice and guidance uh, to people, and there are a lot of reoccurring uh, situations. So I'm just thinking, is there a way where we can capture that advice and present it in a way that's more digestible or demystifies the process a little bit, maybe even inspires people or gives them ideas on like, what they could do for their their property. Um, and that, would, I love the idea that I think the guidelines will be really helpful, but uh, you know, oftentimes we, we adopt guidelines and then they'll, we'll never touch them again. So this could be an opportunity for more of like a, a living documentation that continuously uh, update and make a little more human than, than just regulations. One of the things that's... Oh, I'm not going to hear you. Can you hear <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't yeah, think... Pull the tape up. Pull the tape up. Uh, one of the things that uh, all the design review meetings are on tape. You know, the city tapes the design review meetings. They don't do the historic preservation commission, but they do design review. So if somebody wants to go back and has a particular, they can go through agendas, they can figure that out if they want to listen to that. I think it would be great to do kind of a summary of uh, decisions, but I, I don't know how practical or possible that is uh, with you know, the current staff. Could it be an addendum to your design guidelines? It seems like some of the design guidelines actually do show you uh, yeah, yeah, existing the, conditions and, and what not to do. I, and what to do. So. We're gonna do we're gonna do that. And yeah. Hopefully we use examples for the positive stuff in the community. I don't want to use the negative stuff, yeah. but the positive stuff in the Kella Covered Library is a really good example of okay, this got through design review. Uh, uh, I think um, a lot more positive outreach would be valuable. With maybe you know in the introduction some photos showing some successful projects, offering committees as a resource, even for somebody. I mean, send it, anybody who buys a house in the historic district, or buys a property that's on the historic register, we ought to be sending them out a letter saying congratulations. You now own a very valuable piece of property because it's in the historic district design review district. Uh, offer to use our committee as a resource. If you're thinking of doing something, you don't have to come, you know, file a specific application and pay any money. Just come to before the committee for an informal presentation. You know, what what you're thinking of doing. Uh, I think that would I think that would be really helpful to people. And again, there are people on the committee who who have a lot of expertise. I think it's incredibly valuable. Can people not in the district come? <laughs> <laughs> Free advice? <laughs> Anybody it's in the city of Montpelier. It's an open meeting. Any, <laughs> any taxpayer's already prepaid, so you might as well. I have one of those houses that lost its character over time. Yeah. So, need all the advice we can get. <laughs> a great opportunity to recapture some of it. Yeah. Can I add a couple of things in? Um, we do have a couple of uh, design guidelines that are on our website that are, uh, they were done maybe 10 years ago, uh, that are on a couple of particular architectural elements on porches, on windows. Uh, but they're really just kind of discussing best practices. And so I think, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I think what we've been envisioning is taking those and updating them and showing some uh, success stories and showing ways that um, the standards are met and ways in which they aren't visually uh, showing examples uh, that can help folks to design their project and going through even, um, you know, we've updated uh, specific um, submittal materials that are needed so that the design review committee can really understand the context of this project. So if someone is coming in looking to replace their windows, now it's very clear that, you know, you need uh, photographs of the windows that are deteriorated that are a problem. Um, 
so that uh, they can understand how, also, you know, with these design guidelines that'll help illustrate, be a compendium, sort of a compendium to going through the application process. Um, and I think that that's sort of where we're trying to usher this um, eventually, but we have to take this very first step here with the, um, the regulations. But we have been providing some of that guidance, and I, you know, there are other ways you can tap into that sort of uh, um, <clears throat> great information that's coming out of those specific meetings, but you have to know what you're looking for to do that. So, What sections uh, have... Did you say some of the sections uh, address the materials that yes. need to be provided? What section? Under the, um, there's the application process, is 2201G, Section G, Submittal Requirements. Um, and so this is really, I think, providing a lot more clarity to the application process um, for when folks have to come and present. You know, I guess um, prior to that, there, you know, there, We've already figured out whether or not it's exempt and whether it has to go to the design review committee or not. But if you do have to, if it's not exempt, and then going through the application process, there's uh, in that process right off the bat the opportunity for administrative review. And again, that's a new, uh, a new feature that um, we were able to create within those existing, um, the existing framework. Um, then the submittal requirements um, talk about what type of information needs to be presented and how to the design review committee so that um, someone can't come in with a half design project and expect to get through that meeting with uh, an approval unless it's clear. I think that helps the design review committee as well, uh, you know, uh, protect their uh, ability to consider these projects because sometimes they do take a little bit of uh, charrette and figuring out back and forth and then it's on to the homeowner to figure out you know the best way forward um, so that uh, I think that section uh, helps and through that process there's no requirements for example to have architectural drawings or something that would come at a cost to a homeowner uh, you know it, it, but providing the information in a way that uh, the design review committee can understand the context of the project. So we developed them with a sensitivity of allowing homeowners to be able to navigate through this process, I think, gi giving them the ability to not incur extra cost or have to hire specialists to do this, but because there's a certain amount of information that needs to be obtained, that's that's why we tried to clarify that. Um, of course, the Design Review Committee also sees projects that where owners hire architects or other professionals to present you know, with um, architectural drawings, and you need to accommodate for that as well. Hey, Bob. Yeah, I was glad to see under the submittal uh, materials that you're asking for photographs of neighboring structures, too, because so much, many times someone thinks all I'm doing is adding on to my house and not recognizing how it affects the structures around them. So, uh, yeah, this is a very clear list. It seems really helpful. I had one question from before, something that came up. Um, so, a lot of us don't have a background with the Secretary of Interior standards and, and the various like standards that, that exist out there. But I know that's a surprise. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's good that we don't have any background in this because we're able to approach it like any resident. Yeah. Right? right. But uh, uh, anyway, um, so, so based on this conversation, I'm understanding that different versions of those standards must exist. You're, this is not completely boilerplate. So this is a one version of those, but if you could talk about that, that would that would be great to help us understand it, because I mean, that's inevitably going to come up. Um, so the, the National Park Service, their guidance for um, historic design review districts is start with the standards, but then customize them so that it, they are specific to your community 
not every community is the same. Um, but the goal is not to contradict what is in the standards. Um, so we did not include every single standard um, from the Secretary of the Interior explicitly in this. But we also did not contradict any of the ones that we left out. Some of them we combined to rephrase or you know, change the emphasis about what we think is important specifically for Montpelier. Um, but in general, um, design review districts can either take the boilerplate language and just cut and paste and then add a few on specifically for their community, or they can modify the language a little bit as long as it's still within the, the intention that is behind the original language. Can you, can you give us just an idea of what percentage of the 17 pages of regulations are in addition to those standards? Um, most, <laughs> because most of these, most of the 17 pages is specifically talking kind of a, the logistics. Um, the, the Secretary of Interior standards are most directly relevant to what we call our general design standards. So one through 14. So Section the actual J. criteria that are looked at and then the process and everything is the separate? Yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. So, um, you know, all of the, the intro material about administrative review and all of that, that's specific to our community. And then getting down into Section K and after that, that is also items that are specific to our community that are basically trying to go into more... Um, zoning language that support those general design standards that um, are based on the Secretary of Interior standards. I mean, one way to look at this is your, your general standards are your overarching criteria statements about what is desired. Correct me if I'm wrong. Your specific design standards are, in some ways, how these are being applied to very specific instances like signs or you know how to deal with a roof shape you know because and, and those are things that aren't in the current regs the current regulations are mostly just here are our general design standards how is it how is an applicant supposed to know how that's going to apply to them changing the shape of their roof they have mm -hmm. no idea unless they have worked with the you know national and national park service standards on some other project um but your standard homeowner is going to be able to dig down and go what's my project or have us point to it this is what i'm doing okay here's your subset that applies you're probably going to be fine but let's go before the design review committee and also let's these specific standards are also how the administrative officer can do some administrative approvals without these specific standards the zoning administrator can't approve anything one of the, we picked the most flexible of the Secretary of Interior standards. There are Secretary of Interior standards for restoration. There, I, if you took all the paper on the desk there and piled it up, I, there's just lots of different, there's standards for landscaping, there's standards for, but they just really don't apply. I mean, what we're doing is, if somebody wants to restore a building, really go back and restore it. That, you know, this so can be done it, under Eric, these can standards. Can you go over the restore, replace, rehab, the difference between the three? Yeah, rehabilitation. Restore means you put it back the way right. it was. You pick a time period mm -hmm. okay. and do everything that it matches. And it has to be documented. It can't be speculative in the standard. You can't say, well, a house of this period, this is probably what you wanted. The house of this period might have had X, Y, and Z. You have to be, have some kind of documentation. If you're going to do the Secretary of Interior's standards for restoration, if you're going to do rehabilitation, you can do the speculation. It's better to do, you know, have documentation as to what it was, old photographs or whatever. But the Secretary of Interior's standards are really extensive. I actually sat on the committee for the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers that reviewed these a few years ago. <laughs> so is, there, is there any kind of precedent that exists for interpreting these standards? 
I mean, the Park Service actually publishes a series of interpretive guidelines, and so, basically, so you someone get, walked in with Park Service me material, wrong, the, and they said, "I have some precedent yeah. here. Would we follow it, or would we say, well, this is our interpretation of the standards?" I think yeah, this is. Uh, uh, I think a difficult in drafting standards. If you draft them with too much detail, they become totally inflexible, and you're going to miss something because you can't cover everything. And then it becomes instead of 17 pages, it becomes 170. Uh, but uh, there, there's guidelines for all the standards that uh, and that the Secretary of Interior publishes that are available online. Uh, so, so as as Montpelier, do you are we going to try to like stay in line with what the what the you, you answered his question Interior? with an it's complicated. Yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, I, I, no, mean, I, I mean, this I think yeah, I, I, I don't expect you guys I don't expect you to be able to answer everything, but I but I do think yeah. like just conceptually, each of you who are making going to be making these d interpretation decisions, do you conceptually see this as this is Montpelier's version of this that we own? Or we we must follow other of interpretations closer to the source, such as the Department I see, of Interior. I say it's Montpelier because you have to make object, uh, you so, know, make decisions yeah. and changes based on code, uh, based on use of a building, mm -hmm. uh, and each state is free to do that too. I think it means that we need to be careful in trying in, in talking about this with the public as something that exists set in stone out, because it's it's actually more fuzzy as i think meredith said earlier than than that so i think we just need to be careful about um, there's it, someone else jumping in I, I don't talk much at all <laughs> um when we were drafting my name's jenna lapachinsky um i am on the preservation commission and i work for the preservation trust of vermont when we were drafting um the specific guidelines as they apply to projects, we pulled information from the guidelines that exist through the Park Service and applied them to projects in Montpelier. So while they are specific to place, the content of them is based on precedent. So I think if there were questions about it, we could point to the Park Service's material in almost any instance and say this is how they interpret it and that's why we're doing it that way. That helps. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, one other point of clarification, we've referenced uh, right above in the design review standards the actual Secretary of the Interior standards as a reference in the review of applications along with we left the placeholder here for our future guidelines, our future design guidelines because those will help help to take those two um, things that you were just talking about, the sort of global view and the local view, and, and they do get merged together in these general design standards. So if you were to take the Secretary of T Interior Standards as written by the Park Service, and if we were to put them, as we were saying earlier, next to this, you would see a lot of similarity, uh, and then a few things added in that the, the, the standards don't necessarily cover to the development or the things that we're trying to achieve here. And um, um, with that, uh, this is all uh, dealing with um, infill development, and so, or at least th what's going on within the district, and so um, understanding how that, that um, ties together in uh, the response of those things together. can give you an example, Kirby, that may be really helpful. It's from a long time ago. Eric, you're going to have to speak up more because I have to turn this on because everyone's going to fall. Uh, uh, the bank downtown, the one with the clock, used to have a metal cheese grater on the front. And that's what it looked like. You could see through it. And uh, the division where I then worked got some money to fix that. Well, part of the in putting that on, they would removed lintels on the top two floors over the windows, and they were cast iron. Now, if you strictly follow the standards, you replace them with cast iron lintels. But they're fiberglass, and really on a cost basis. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a, a little bit of flexibility, and I, I think, 
you know, they are, I was part of the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, and they really wanted flexibility in the standards. And people are going to make the decisions, and they're going to have different ideas about things. And that, I think that's just the way any board or commission is. Uh, it's not everybody, not everybody's in lockstep on things. Yeah, I mean, of course, there'll be some element of discretion, and you need to have that. It's just figuring out how how these regulations align with precedent and how they're... It sounds like there will be a lot of guidance about how to interpret these based on what the Parks Service has already published and the development of these guidelines. Although, to me, that's unclear. If it's, if it's going to be for applicants, then is it binding on the Design Review Committee? No, it's, it's not binding. Okay. It's guidance. The regulations are the binding part. Right. The guidance, you, people can refer to it and say, mm -hmm. hey, this is what we want to do. But in any set situation, what is in that guideline may not specifically work. You know, we don't want them necessarily copying the guideline if you're saying, you know, I'm working on building B, it needs to be consistent with building A and building C. How you interpret that is going to vary. So they're going to be examples. They're not going to be, this is exactly what you're supposed to do. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Barbara. So in, in 2201I, it talks about the actually including the Secretary of the Interior standards as an appendix, does that mean an appendix to this? Sorry, it's page. Uh, yep. Six. So, so they're going to be appendix appendices as a reference. It's not something, and, and there's. You can also, you know, planning commission can do what they want with that paragraph. It was trying to find a way to reference in here that these are potential guidelines for the DRC to use. But these design guidelines. I mean, these design standards were developed from the Secretary's interior As, standards, not in addition to. Right, and th what's 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 in here is so. Right, so this is explaining just that. If they're tr in, in trying to deal with applications, if they run into an issue here they can go look at the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation as guidance. It's guidance, but not necessarily. It's not it a right, it, right, it is weight. not, it is not the weight of these, it's guidance. And that language can definitely be played with. How much longer is this document going to be? Uh, but it's, it's, I mean, it, we, we're saying this is an appendix, it might be a link on the city website. You know, and that's, I mean, they're currently linked on the city website. That's another thing, just going back to the resources and reaching out to public and all of that. That's also a me measure of just staff bandwidth. It's been, a, I've been in this position for a little over a year, updating DRB, DRC, planning department, and HPC websites has been on that agenda for a really long time, and I literally have never had a breath to do it. Um, neither has Audra. So anything you come up with as wish list items for that, Send it to me through Mike. We'll add it to the list, and eventually we're going to get that all updated. I would be concerned that someone's going to use this against you and say that yeah. this is an exhaustive list and you can't use anything outside of this. Um, because it says that you uh, may consult those things. Right, so. and any other supplemental educational publications or brochures prepared by the committee or the city's historic preservation commission. I mean, there's, it's a we can throw a whole bunch of stuff in there, or yeah, or you could get rid of it or change how it's phrased. This was. This was one way to throw it in here. Yeah, this is where having all the lawyers on the planning commission gets a little tiring, but important. Oh, oh very no, 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 trust me. Is <laughs> it <said> important? <laughs> Practicing the attorney for six years, there's been lots of oh, right. minds yeah. going, and there's yeah. Yeah. other, there's, there's been lots of minds on and off this and trying to find a balance. Um, I'm not usually a stickler, but I have, I think recently in the city we've seen some and lawsuits that are like yep and honing on things like this so oh oh yeah. yeah um so you know this is one reason this is what hpc came up with as sort of their wish list of how to deal with this mm -hmm. it's now coming to planning commission to poke holes mm -hmm. do what they need to do to make 
this document something that you support to then move up to city council and i think you know i don't necessarily want to talk for everybody here i know that if there comes a time when you need me to come up and be here along with mike for a meeting and i'm sure other members of hpc and and drc would be willing as well um you know let us know it's not it's not like we're only available for this meeting there's a lot of people who had thoughts Aaron, you I haven't heard much from you. Uh, so, kind of taking off from Kirby's last point, I'm, I'm looking at this document. I'm looking at the original uh, guide, looking at the original uh, regs. I'm looking at the new ones. The way I'm sort of reading, and this is just because I have zero experience with how this works in practice. Can you walk me through, since we have a bunch of people from the boards here, can you walk me through how you guys, under the current regs, you know, there's some pretty broad uh, sort of general design standards that you guys are looking at. That's I think 2201D in the current regs. Um, that's supposedly embodied in 2201J, I think, in the new ones. <coughs> All, but after that, you've got specific design requirements, even in the old regs, and particularly in the new ones, that to me are read, when I read them, they seem kind of prescriptive. It's, there's, there's a lot of shalls in there. Like, it shall do this, you shall do that. And the list is pretty significant, particularly in the new ones. So how does, how do the, the committees now approach that language? Like, how do you sort of synthesize all of these requirements when you're reviewing the project? Because I guess my concern here is, is like, if, if ultimately what you guys are saying to me today is that you don't see that there's going to be a lot of change in the way that you approach, like how projects are approved under this new language. I just want to make sure that the process that you envision undertaking when reviewing these things is consistent with the language that you're proposing. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, I, I think so. So <clears throat> a lot of those shalls in the current regulations mm -hmm. are dealt with at the administrative level. We're not letting something go necessarily to the design review committee unless mm -hmm. they've already met those shalls. Right. Those the, and and then the and so we get that stuff incorporated into the application, and then for all the things where it's a judgment call, it's a should or it's your general standards that then goes up to the design review committee. Right. Um, one reason I think there's so many more specific shells in the new regulations, if this goes for your question, is to allow that administrative approval. Because right now there isn't specifically administrative approval for design review okay, projects. Um, you know, Steve, I don't know if if you're best to discuss the actual process of going through the criteria when it comes to getting an application before the design review committee. I mean, it's it's Steve's probably the best person. Yeah, I, I don't know if you want to come up to the mic and, and go through that. Um, I mean, it's all it's the judgment call a lot of the time. Again, we try to do what's it's been many, many times. It's a compromise. It's a compromise between what people want to do, what they can afford to do, what the shell says in the application or in the, the standards. Um, so again, we view these as guidelines and we try to adhere to them when, you know, as much as you can, but a lot of them, a lot of them are fairly flexible. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. There are a lot of ways to maintain the character, especially given the new technology, new materials that weren't available 100 years ago. So a lot of times you can replace a cornice, as Eric referred to one, you can replace it with fiberglass or a material that will give you the same appearance. It maintains the integrity of the building, but you don't have to have somebody go up there and use plaster or concrete or a technique that was used maybe a hundred years ago, maybe even with materials that nobody even uses anymore. 
so a lot of times you have to adapt it to current current availability, current construction procedures, current materials. So again, that's why we have a mix of people on the committee that make it, you know, a valuable resource because of what people know what's available, people know what standards are. So again, a lot of times it's a compromise. Steve, under the new building standards, there's one of those shell statements about new construction shall incorporate historic architectural elements that reinforce or add to the character of the area. And it seems like that's in contradiction to one of the earlier sections that said you're not going to replicate something from a previous era when this is clearly a new building. So this is all, this is for new construction. Yeah, I was just surprised about that. It says that. like you shall not use, you know, historical elements and two pages later it says you shall, shall incorporate right, historical yeah. elements. Yeah. That, I know there are some. Which, there are wait, some wait, 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 what, what it's some, at the top of page 11, bottom of page 10, under context and con connectivity. It says new construction shall incorporate historic architectural elements that reinforce or add to the character of the area, which seems to be in contradiction with 2201J8. I think adding, I don't know, maybe you can talk about that. I think that this might be uh, a wording confusion that maybe we can clarify. It is not that it is intending to incorporate a salvaged front door. No. <laughs> it, no. It, it, the, oh, the intention behind this one was that if you are in a string of buildings with really large, substantial, heavy cornices, the new design should have a cornice element. It can be a contemporary contor cornice element, but it should not be completely um, departing from that sense of rhythm um, and balance of that, that block. Then in that case, I think you'd want to reconsider the use of the word historic at the bottom of page 10, because that makes it sound as if you yeah. really do want them to replicate that cornice. Just, dropping the if word. You you just take the word historic out. Yeah. I yeah. Think that would be the... Just, yeah. I mean, I certainly understand you want yes. elements that are consistent. And yeah. Sorry, that was my one my one little point. A that good I one. I wanted to uh, give a, an example, I think, going back to what you were just asking for about how these two might play out. So for example, in the current regs under um, section D, number six, the, the top it says the design review committee shall evaluate design review plans based on the following considerations. And number six just says location and appearance of all utilities. And it gives no direction. It, what does that mean? What should they look at? So if you go to the uh, page seven of the new regs under section J, number nine, top of page seven, uh, second sentence in says location and appearance of all utilities, mechanical, trash, storage, fencing. We lumped a bunch of other things in there, but shall be cited to minimize adverse impact, visual impact, or adequately and appropriately screened from the public view. So that starts to give some direction about locating them on the sides or the back of buildings or places where they're not visually obtrusive. Um, just I, there, that's just one example of many of the different elements where we try to add a little more detail to give guidance to the design review committee. Um, and so again, we're, we're, um, we're not recreating the wheel here. We're just adding a few more spokes in to help it uh, run a little more smoothly, perhaps. Sure, but let's assume that let's assume you can't with this project. Hmm? Let's assume you you can't uh, you can't change the location and the appearance of utilities, mechanical equipment, trash storage, fencing uh, to minimize adverse visual impact or adequately and appropriately screen for public view. What if that's just not possible? That's where the whole fact that the design review committee is a advisory committee comes into play. Mm -hmm. They put forward their recommendations. It then goes to the you know, zoning administrator or the DRB to look at the bigger picture of the rest of the regulations and the rest of the project. 
that the design review committee hasn't looked at at all to figure out whether or not that is is necessary. Um, I can't remember if this says Um, it just says shall, so the shall is shall be compatible, right? Compatible is a pretty broad, subjective idea. The fencing the, shall be minimized right, size in the next sentence. Yeah, shall to be minimize. Right. The, minimize doesn't mean you can't see it. It means minimize. So minimize, and you could just throw in there, minimize to the greatest extent, you know, yes. allow, or, 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 you know, you can throw in a qualifier in there as you're getting into the finer points of it to make it so that you feel like it's more enforceable. However, on the other hand, you know, there's there's an administrative aspect of it. Sure, no, I get that. I, I think the, the core of my question is getting lost here. What does this, so in the old regs it says they just consider it, right? right? And it's vague. I get your point. I see why you would want to do it. What does this language instruct the committee to do? Let's say, let's say it's violative of sub nine with respect to utilities. There's always a way to minimize. Yeah. So you make them add some screening. Either location or screening. I mean, a case in point, in Nice, France, these multi-story buildings have balconies and everybody's gone to heat pumps and the compressors are very small and they've put them in, in the balconies behind railings and they're usually against a wall and they are painted or, or somehow colored so that they blend into the building. I've got pictures of them and you're walking down the street and you can't tell they're there. So you're dealing with an 800 year old building that's now got you know, heat pump for heating and air conditioning. It's indicative and of you, the time. And they're outside, so it's a it's technology that used creatively to make an efficient building. And they've got heat pumps. I mean there's fifty of them on the face of the building and you can't see any of them unless you, you look really carefully. Eight hundred <laughs> years old. Yeah. So, not they not they heat pumps. No, oh, it's not not here. I think that might have been lost. It was in France. France on the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> not a historian. <laughs> not, uh, not in the U.S. <laughs> no, not in the TPs. <laughs> So uh, one other thing I want to add is that whether it's the Secretary of the Interior Standards or our general design standards, they're written in a way to be applied broadly because they have to be. Every project's going to be different. Every streetscape is going to be different and how something is achieved on one building may or may not work next door or in another neighborhood. So what this, as someone goes through this process, there are a lot of, there's consultation that, that can happen and that's where we trust in the uh, members of the, of the design review committee to help usher this to the to the place where there you have to allow a little give and take so these these the shalls um, I think are directed towards goals and philosophies but there's always a way as Steve said there's always a way to find uh, the uh, ways to resolve this if if you come up against a hard stop uh, because that has to happen we can't if 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 not then nothing would go forward because lots of things but also you can't vote against anything if you have too many the, outs, basically, too many loopholes. Well, and there's, I think, in my time with the Design Review Committee, last week might have been the first, or the last meeting might have been the first time that the Design Review Committee has said, we're not approving this because of X reason. Um, and so then what, in, what ended up happening is we approved most of the permit from the ZA standard, the administrative permit, but we said, but this one feature, you can't do. Your sign can't have this lighting feature. We'll see if it gets appealed, but 
you know, that that was that, that was the, the old the yeah. He, well, that was the applicant. The applicant we'll, we'll was see. thrilled because it was we'll a corporate the issue company. that he didn't want to follow through with. And he was thrilled when we said no because he could go back and say they won't let me do that, so you have to do this. So that one Which worked is out. What he was awesome. looking for. But for now, so he was thrilled. <laughs> but can I just go back to the the utilities example for just a second? Sure. So, when it comes to exterior placement of utilities. That's one of the things that an administrative officer can approve if it's, you know, certain ones, it's in subsection H1C, as long as these things are on the side of building elevations. When I then go down and look at the specific standard, <clears throat> standards and it tells me we have to minimize visual impact on those utilities, I can then say, I can point to that and say, oh, you know what, applicant? Yes, I can approve your heat pump on the side of your building, but guess what? It can't be neon orange. Let's try and make it a color that blends in with the color of your siding and or put up some screening. That gives me something to point to to then put conditions on my administrative permit. Without that shall on there, there is, you know, on the minimized visual impact, there's nothing for me to point to for that condition that I'm going to put on an administrative permit. And it's the same thing for the DRB. They're just throwing conditions on there out of nowhere that are really hard to defend if somebody appeals it. I think another thing that you're saying that I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines here is that the DRB or administrative approval, maybe the administrative approval is different actually, but you're not going to, just because there's a shall in sub nine, you're not necessarily going to flag that on every single project if it doesn't seem like it's going to be an issue, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, or that's... Because they've already met it, right? That would be the interpretation. It's already met, or if you, if you just acknowledge that it would be impossible to improve on, you, you're just not going to go there, right? Well, especially like, if it's like, shell You don't minimize. have to just because it says shell. Most, that's, most that's of the time people who are coming in with projects and they're upgrading to heat pumps or to, you know, some outside utility, yeah. they're, they're trying to hide it anyway. I mean, we've seen another, a number of commercial projects come in and they're putting in new propane tanks, maybe a larger propane tanks because they're moving you know, they're going to some high efficiency heating system and they're burying them because they don't want to see them either. And they, or they're in, in an area where they don't want it to block public access or a driveway or something else so they can put it, they can bury it and then you don't even see it. Or you screen it with landscaping. So most of the time people care about the way their places look and they don't want to plank some ugly looking thing out in their front yard anyway. I, I, so again, most of that's creative problem solving. And, and I think the, you know, in the way of utilities, some of the difficulty comes with the electric company. They want to put the meters on the front of the house where they're really easy to read. <laughs> and we would say, say, no, it's possible to put them around the corner, and that minimizes the impact. I, mean, I think that's okay. And the same thing with dumpsters. The guy's got a small lot. Maybe you're going to be able to see the dumpster no matter where you put it, but don't put it in the front yard, or don't you know don't you know don't uh, put it somewhere. And you know you usually get the argument, well, the trash truck has a hard time. Well, they're really good drivers, so they can take care of it if they want to. So one of the, the items in here on page seven, um, number 10, um, this is something that, that we, we did get some feedback that was generally supportive and was in the previous design standards. I think the, the language has changed a little bit and this is talking about vistas. Um, but this is something that I do wanna just kind of put out there that, um, this one's going to be a little bit open-ended until the new master plan goes through. Um, and we're really hoping that some of what we've drafted in here um, can kind of help direct the master plan to then kind of support back into this. Um, because, you know, the Preservation Commission, we, we love the vistas of the city. I, I don't know that any of us are our landscape specialists to, to really evaluate and establish which ones are important to the city to preserve. Um, and so this was just one example where I think that you all as planners can kind of help 
add back into maybe some areas that are not our strong suit. Um, or if there are other items in the design review regulations that maybe we just completely missed because it's not something we think about in our, our professions or our volunteer lives. Um, so I just wanted to put that, that back out there that this is a, a larger design review district um, that maybe there are other aspects of design review, especially maybe with new construction as well that um, so some other folks might have some expertise that could could get added in here. So yeah, and this language here is this one of the was this from the Secretary of Interior? No, no, no. This was separate? something that we had added okay. in because it had been in our current regulation. Oh, I see. Okay. So okay. So how is it being interpreted in the current regulations? Um. <laughs> the, the, Currently, the main gateway views being discussed are basically gateway views of the state house, mm -hmm. and there's this is something Mike Miller and I have discussed a lot that the planning commission is probably going to need to take on at some point as to figure out or hire somebody to do or find a way to get a grant to have somebody do it to figure out what are the view sheets that are important to Montpelier, not just of the state house but any others. Um, and something to throw into that mix is when you're thinking about those, are any of those views, views of green space and green space that you might potentially want to exempt from being allowed to have solar development? Solar development, um, because right now you really can't limit where, especially individual solar is put at all, but one way it could potentially be limited is if there is a view shed that is very important and protected and mentioned in the master plan. So just since we were getting into that discussion point, I wanted to throw that out there. I know that's a, I know that's a big head explosion point, but it's it's mm -hmm. it, it is something that sort of goes into this. I don't think that the view sheds needs to be specifically dealt with to adopt these regulations because there is currently a a standard that the design review committee and um, you know as zoning administrator and the DRB we all look to is different views as you're coming into the city especially the view of the state house but it's something to mull over especially when you're starting to look at potentially in the future redesigning where the design review districts are it might be throwing in some other view shed overlays okay. longer term thinking yeah, no. But since the question yeah. got since it got approached, <laughs> yeah. Well, and to just build on that a little bit more, it's not just solar development. It's it's really any development because this language is actually uh, included in the Quichi analysis. Mm -hmm. So within Act 250, looking at how the the fit part of a project, um, having done reviewed a lot of different projects, both solar and otherwise, um, in that within that lens, it's where it is written in the master plan is where it is defensible for a city to uh, and that is a real subjective thing these what is so though what the, they have to be established and uh, identified in order for them to be protected okay. and i'm sure you're aware of this mike has done work with view sheds he has a lot of he can guide you much more than I can on that. Oh, okay. So when he's back, feel free to discuss it with him in depth. He's okay. not going to like me for saying that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my thought is some of those properties might not be within the district. So how does that work? Yeah. That, that's, that's why it's part of the larger question of the whole district as a whole mm -hmm. and how you, whether you add new overlays, whether you expand the district. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're running low on time. John's leaving, so uh, it's our clock. Um, okay, thanks for coming. Well, yeah, really, it's very, you've done a lot of great work and given us a lot of explanation and answers, and I, I, I the Planning Commission without me will be able to take it going forward. We should talk about next steps real quick. Yeah. Like a minute. yeah, we'd be happy to meet with you again if you look at them and have a discussion and figure out some more things. And I want to thank you for your efforts on this. Yeah. Thank you. And 
certainly the members of the Historic Preservation Commission, they worked hard. It's a lot of different views and expertise, which makes it good. Yeah. Yes. All right, do you want to lead the discussion on, oh, Barbara's a question. So do we need to, I mean, finish out their presentation here, go through all the points? That's my question. I'm not saying that necessarily that we should. Thank you. See, thanks. I don't think we'll get I don't mean tonight. folks to come back. I don't, know. I don't know. I mean, my recommendation would be that the Planning Commission take this up at the next meeting and go through the actual language. Um, everyone should review it in advance and then come prepared to talk about concerns that they have. Um, I think that walking through it, nonetheless, will probably be a good use of time, even though it's slow. At, at this point, and this is I'm asking this question to the to the room. Um, would if 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 the planning commission started to review this, would it be preferable uh, that we review it with the idea of making any recommendations to city council? Or it seems premature for that, right? We should be reviewing it to make recommendations back to historic preservation. Does that does that sound better? Well, yeah, I would I would agree with that. Yeah. And based on the examples that I mean, Barb flagged something where the yeah. elimination of one errant word resolved the yeah. issue so right. maybe inviting you know the planning commission can go through put together a list of notes and then bring you back to answer questions about the specific language i wonder if we could borrow meredith for that conversation and she could be the liaison between the um, I can do that. Whether or not I can attend your next meeting, I'm not quite sure because it depends on when your next meeting is. Um, but that's the other thing is I can also be a li liaison in between a little bit if there's anything that specific questions that I could answer ahead of time. And also, yeah, however, however we want to do it. It can go back to HPC as a full and then we can, um, you know, address your comments either in person or in writing. It kind of depends on what you want to do and how quickly you want to do it. I think whatever you want, we can find a way to make it happen. I wish I would just discuss it maybe, maybe do some informal discussion next week and then tentatively plan to schedule something in the future where you come in and we go through and, and have and, and flag the suggestions okay. to bring back. Is that okay yeah, with everyone? I can do that. Um, so HPC meets once a month. Um, so, and, but, the, but we can also have special meetings if need be. So you want me to come back solo after you've gone through and then take we'll, it back we'll to We'll talk HBC? about it next week, but just tentatively okay. we'll, we'll say that. Okay. Um, we can get some people here. Okay. Or do, you, do you want HPC here next week, next meeting, or do you want to do it solo? I don't think next meeting. Yeah. I don't think we'll be ready yeah. yet. Is that, is that okay with everyone? Yeah. So we'll wait for an invitation. <laughs> we'll go. try to be polished in our presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let thanks. you go. We've got to go over the minutes from the last meeting and approve those. But thanks again, and sure. have a good evening. Um, okay. So moving on to item six in the agenda, consider the minutes from June 10th. Do I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Any discussion? Oh, I should write down who moved. Your final act as chair. Okay. Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Okay, they are approved. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, I've already moved. Second. Sure. Sure. All right. This is a non-debatable uh, item. So, wait, wait, wait. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Right. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you.